1, verses 1 to 3 and verse 14. Probably could all say John 1 1 without uh, reading it. Can we quote it out loud together, those of us that think we might know it? John 1 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and with him was not anything made that was made. Amen? And verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of of grace and truth. Let us pray. Oh God, our Father, we worship you, we adore you, we bow down before you right now, recognizing our need of salvation and even forgiveness of sin in our Christian lives. And it's all possible because Jesus, your Son, the only begotten of the Father, the one and only, the unique one, no one else in the universe ever like him. He is God. He is one with you, as he himself claimed in this wonderful book. And we worship you, Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, our Helper, our friend, and we thank you today that as we come before you, that we can ask and you hear our prayer and help us. We thank you that you are helping the sick. We thank you that you helped Lori this week. We pray for continued healing for her heart and her body. We thank you that you help Jackie day by day. We thank you that you've helped Lois. We thank you that right now you're helping Jan. We pray for complete healing for her. We thank you even, Lord, that you help us as we come together as a church family, that we can lift each other's spirit through your help. And so today, as we come, we ask your blessing, your encouragement, your strength, your peace in each of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Dave. That was fun to uh, read with him, and, uh, or quote with him. Today we're going to be talking about the deity of Christ. The deity of Christ. That means that Jesus is God. I had somebody who once said to me, what does deity mean? It means God, that Jesus is God. Now most people can tolerate a conversation about God. Have you ever noticed that people are very free to talk about God because the idea of God is kind of just uh, a undefined entity and they will just throw around their ideas of God just however they want and because everybody has a different idea of the word God and what it means, then it, it's really kind of uh, just acceptable to talk about God in a general sense. But have you ever noticed that is, as soon as you mention Jesus, 
it changes the conversation completely. There is much hostility towards the name of Jesus. People can tolerate the idea of God, but they cannot tolerate the idea of Jesus. And especially if we affirm that Jesus is God. They're okay with Jesus to a certain point. If you were to say that Jesus is just a prophet, they would accept that. If you were to say that Jesus was a good person, many would accept that. But as soon as you affirm any kind of a connection between Jesus and God, then the conversation takes a negative turn, usually. They're hostile towards the idea that Jesus is God. They reject that idea. And this is really <clears throat> the foundation of our faith. Because our God took on flesh and dwelt among us. Not only that, but he died on a cross to pay for our sin. And he rose again, proving his identity as God and his power to forgive sin. Today we're going to make a case for <clears throat> the deity of Christ. We're starting in this new series in the Gospel of John. And it's interesting how that John begins his book with the statement about the identity of of Jesus. He starts off with this notion that Jesus is God. Because what we do with Jesus makes a huge difference on where we will spend eternity. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Very exclusive because there's only one way to the Father and that's through Jesus. God the Son who came in the flesh to die for our sin. So we're going to explore this idea of our doctrine, I guess would be a better way to say it, the doctrine of the deity of Christ. Now, because of the short brevity of our time, we don't have time to be very deep, uh, but I'm going to give you some tools uh, for your tool belt when you talk to people about Jesus. We're going to start with what John started with, with this a concept uh, that Jesus is eternal. Now, this is very important because if we're talking about Jesus being God, then, we ha then he needs to be eternal. He needs to be outside of time. So in the few verses that we're going to, to look at today, we're establishing Jesus' true identity. John begins with the words, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, many have gotten the wrong idea about the first words in the book of John. Now, they got the wrong idea. Why? Because they don't want to believe that Jesus is God. So they begin by by downplaying these important words that establish Jesus' identity. If you were to give a superficial impression of the English, somehow some people would attribute this idea that the word who we will establish is Jesus 
had a beginning. And many false religions assert that Jesus had a beginning because in the beginning was the Word. Now everyone can agree that there was a beginning. Everyone talks about a beginning. There's a beginning. Even evolutionists believe that there was a beginning. Things don't just go on for all eternity. There is a beginning. And everyone establishes that there is a beginning, even their crazy theory of the Big Bang. I said that on purpose. But the point is, is that there is a beginning. John affirms the fact that there is a beginning as is described in Genesis chapter 1. John affirms the fact that there is a beginning that God created the heavens and the earth, that there was a beginning. Now the word here is translated logos, and that means that is the, the word that we're talking about, Jesus. And, the, and actually the word itself, the the the. Um, the characters of the word that, um, I don't know what you, what you call it, the word word, um, here transcends actually time, the way it, it is uh, placed in the, in the text. So the text itself, the actual word, is a transcendent in time. So... It's outside of the beginning. So the statement, in the beginning was the word. In the Greek, John uses the imperfect tense of the word was. This imperfect tense means that, that this word is outside of the time where the beginning started. There is something that acts upon the beginning. This imperfect tense is a continuing action from the past. So when, when John says, in the beginning was the word, there is a continuing action from the past that brings him into the beginning. So in other words, he's eternal. There's something outside of time. So even in this very simple statement, in the beginning was the Word, we establish that the Word is eternal. And that's not enough. If that's not enough, Paul, John says that the Word was with God. So he says, look, this Word is outside of time, was there at the beginning, before the beginning, and he was with God. And of course, there is the next statement, and the word was God, and we'll deal with that, that phrase a little bit later. But for our purposes right now, what we want to, to establish is that God is eternal, and we understand that, from Scripture, that God is eternal. And the interesting thing was when he talked to Moses in Exodus where the burning bush was going on and God called himself, I am. In that statement, what God was telling Moses was that he is the self-existent one that he exists by himself and there's nothing else that acts upon God or God needs. He is self-existent. So the great I am is established in the Old Testament in Exodus. To be self-existent is to be eternal. There are many instances of God in the Old Testament, 
that attribute his qualities to being eternal. And we can look at a few t this morning just for the sake of context. In Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 37, it says, The eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are the, everla are the everlasting arms. He will thrust you out the enemy from before you. He will thrust out the enemy from before you and will say, destroy. So the phrase I'm looking for here is this idea that the eternal God is your refuge. In Psalm 90, verse 2, it says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever before you formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So what the Old Testament writers understood clearly that God is eternal. And so for our text today, what we're finding is that John equates Christ, Jesus, the Word, with God. Isaiah also affirms that God is eternal in Isaiah 57, verse 15. For thus says the high and lofty one who, inhabit, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. Now in the New Testament, Jesus is given the same quality as being eternal besides the passage that is before us. So what happens is some people think that this passage here doesn't establish that Jesus is God or that he is eternal. And so to help us with that, we need to look at some other New Testament passages to establish that it's not just John 1, 1 to 3 that affirm that Jesus is God, but there are other passages that affirm that as well. And one of them comes from John chapter 8, verse 58. And this is very important because I've already established that God called himself, I am, at, Moses, at the burning bush to Moses. And so here is a statement that Jesus makes to the Pharisees. And he says this, Jesus said, to them, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I want that to sink in for a little bit because what Jesus is saying is before Abraham was, I am. Do you know who God identified himself to as the I am? Not Abraham. It was Moses. That God named himself I am. So the implications of this is really that what Jesus is saying is that even before Abraham, I am. Now, I want to just challenge you on this, on this point. If you read through the Old Testament, especially if you read through Genesis, re read through Genesis, and maybe mark in your Bible how many times that you find the uppercase word Lord, L-O-R-D, in all uppercase. That is the proper name for God, Yahweh. Some used to say it was Jehovah, so you, you're familiar with that, but in more recent times we understand that it's Yahweh. That's the proper name for God. If you go through in, Gen in Genesis, you will find Yahweh, Lord, in all uppercase letters, all through. 
But it isn't until Moses that he was known by that name. He identified himself as Yahweh. Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament. That's why you find the word Yahweh all the way back to the very beginning. Because Moses understood that it's the same God that revealed himself to Moses on that mountain is the same God who created all things. very important because what Jesus is saying here and people have tried to downplay this one and they've tried to say somehow that Jesus didn't mean that he was pre-existent but the Pharisees knew because in verse 59 which I'm not going to put up on the screen you can look it up later they took up stones to kill Jesus for blasphemy because he said he was equal to God. They understood what Jesus was saying and we need to understand that Jesus is saying, I am. I am. He affirmed that he is God. Additionally, Jesus says that he came from the Father and will go back. In John chapter 16, verse 28, it says, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world again. I leave the world and go to the Father. This is a statement of eternity, of, of uh, eternality, that he has ex existed from all time. I came from the Father, I'm going back. In Philippians, we read that Jesus left heaven and humbled himself and returned to his rightful place. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. That form of God is the same essence. Jesus and God are the same essence. Did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. Therefore, God, who, is, who has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus never ceased to be God when he took on humanity. This is so important for you to understand that Jesus took on humanity. God, the Son, took on humanity, did not give up his deity. 100% God, and he took on humanity and became a man. And so he had a human 100% human, but also 100% God. So if we go back to John chapter 1, in this introduction to who Jesus is, in verse 2, we actually get another way that John helps us to identify Jesus as God. We've already established that he calls him God, but here, in verse 2, he says he was in the beginning with God. He was in the beginning with God. Outside of time, he is God, and he is <clears throat> and always has existed. 
as the eternal Son. One God and three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 14, we have the introduction of the Word who became flesh. And it's clear from the text that he's talking about Jesus. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, we're all accustomed to beginnings, aren't we? <clears throat> we each have a birth date. And some of us still celebrate that day. Have you ever thought about eternity? Can you wrap your head around eternity? I sometimes think about, so what are we going to do in heaven? for all of eternity. And I said <clears throat> to myself, I could just ask God what he did before the beginning. He's got all eternity future to tell me about eternity. I don't know how that works because there's no time before, before he started. Time is, is based on how how many revolutions our earth does, right? Uh, and, and years and seasons are all because of the going around the sun. But the point is, is that there was no time before. So maybe that's a stupid question. And when I get to heaven, I won't even think of it. But God is eternal. So if God is eternal, then Jesus is eternal because he was with God in the beginning. And there are implications to Jesus if he's eternal. This means that Jesus is more than just a mere man. The fact that Jesus is eternal has great implications on his mission. His mission was to come into our time, into this world that he created and die on a cross to pay for us, for our sin. So that we could have forgiveness. Jesus could not accomplish anything on the cross if he was not God. I want that to, you to think about that. It's not just that Jesus lived a perfect life and took our place, which is important. But we've offended God and the only person that can forgive the sin that we offended God with is God. God is the only one who can forgive us because we've offended Him. And our sin is so bad that He had to pay the penalty for our sin Himself on a cross. That's what it means for Jesus to come to earth to die for our sin. In Romans 5.8 it says, But God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Whose demonstration of love is this? God's. Who died for our sin God the Son, Jesus Christ, died for our sin. And if Jesus is eternal, this means that it is God who paid for our sin himself. Through the person of Jesus, he paid for our sin. And that should bring a response in our hearts of repentance towards God 
repentance that we are sin that we've sinned against him and putting our trust in Jesus as our Lord and Savior believing that he died and rose again to pay for your sin if Jesus is eternal then he is God and we're going to explore that idea here this doctrine here we've established that Jesus is eternal and we want to dive a little bit deeper into the subject of Jesus as God. In our text, we have the emphatic declaration that Jesus is God in that phrase in the middle of, or at the end of verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. In the Greek, the phrase the word was with God carries the idea that Jesus and God faced each other with perfect communion that's what that idea here is that the word was with God perfect harmony and perfect union because Jesus is God, and John makes that clear here in the text. Now, the Jehovah Witnesses, with their New World's translation, have placed an article, A, in front of the word God, and they translate it, and the word was a God. They claim that this article in front of the word God comes from the Greek. Now, I probably should have put it up on the screen, but here is the Greek statement that is made, written, Theos en ha logos. If you were to read that in the English, just straight across, just translate each little word. Theos in ha logos. You would translate it in English just literally, God is the word. Not God, the word is a God. But it's interesting when they translate it, they misunderstand what the subject of the sentence is. The subject of the sentence is the word. Now here's the problem. In English, we put the subject, verb, and then everything else afterward. That's how we do it in English. In Portuguese, you can put the subject at the end if you want. Spanish, you can put it at the end if you want. And in Greek, you can put the subject at the end of the sentence if you want. So it's an improper translation to say, God is the word. The proper way to understand it in our English is to put the, the subject first. The word is God. So their Greek scholars are wrong. It's not the same to say God is the word than to say the word is God. It's not the same thing. This affirmation, the word is God, helps us to understand that God has 
multiple aspects to him. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're co-equal. One God, one in essence, and yet they have different functions and different purposes. Three persons. We can't look at that today. Last Sunday night, we were talking about Bible interpretation methods after the, after the service. And that's called the study of hermeneutics. And how important the study of Bible interpretation methods are. Poor Bible interpretation methods will always lead to a wrong understanding of of the text. The Bible has one interpretation and we need to make sure that we're clear on what that interpretation is. Otherwise, we'll end up Jehovah Witnesses. Or Mormons. But it's not solely necessary to rely on John 1.1 and their misinterpretation of that phrase and the word is God was God we can go to other passages to prove that Jesus is God now we've already established that Jesus is eternal he is the I am but if you need more we can look at Hebrews chapter 1 in Hebrews chapter 1 the writer of Hebrews wants us to know that Jesus is better than the angels, better than the prophets, better than Moses, and so on and so forth. And he starts off the book with that Jesus is better than the angels. God, who in various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, as is, has in these days spoken by his Son, whom he has appointed heir to all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of the glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now a careful uh, study of this text would reveal that even though he's comparing them to Jesus, to the angels, he is the express image of of his person and upholding all things by the power, by by the word of his power. And it goes on here to say that he purged our sin. This is an an incredible statement about who Jesus is. Much better than the angels. The Mormons think that Jesus is a created being and that Satan is and Jesus were brothers and that God liked Jesus' plan better than Satan so he's holding the grudge. That's what the Mormons teach about Jesus, a created being. And they get around this idea of him being a creator because they believe that they will become gods and create worlds themselves. Blasphemy. Jesus is God. And here in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, we see that he is the express image of his person. At Jesus' birth, he was called Emmanuel, which is translated 
God with us. A prediction from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And it says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall, be, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Matthew 1, 23. Besides, there are several New Testament passages that are quoted in the Old Testament passages about Yahweh and attribute them to Jesus. So they quote Old Testament passages and say, this is Yahweh. If you go to the Old Testament, you would see that word in that text and they are assigning that Yahweh to Jesus. And Peter does that when he assigns the title to Jesus that David used in Psalm 110, verse 1. In Acts, he says this, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but says himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Oops. Another instance is a quote that John uses from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. And in John 12, 41, he writes that Isaiah saw his glory, meaning Jesus. John 12, 41. These things Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spoke of him. So when Isaiah saw the, the throne in Isaiah 6, and he falls before the throne, and I am undone, that scene, the seraphim are, are sing, you know, saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, right? And that whole scene is there. And Peter says, we beheld his glory, Jesus. Imagine what Isaiah saw before the throne of God in Isaiah 6. Then for Peter to attribute that to Jesus is a wonderful admission of Jesus' identity. What does this mean? It means that God came to pay for our sin on a cruel cross. Today we're not going to deal with the Trinity. We can't. But it's important to know that there's one God in three persons. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God the Son came to earth, took on humanity, lived a perfect, sinless life, and died on a cross to pay for our sin. And rose again. Only God can forgive our sin that we commit against him. Our sin separates us from God, but he provided a bridge that will fix that gap between us and him. And that's Jesus. We can't get to God. It was God who reached out to us. If he hadn't done that for us, we would be dead in our sin. Ephesians 2, 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love which, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's what awaits believers. People who have put their faith and trust in Jesus and repented of their sin. Because of Jesus, we can have eternal life in the future. We have a beginning. Jesus had no beginning. He always existed. He's 
God. But he gives us eternal life to be with him for all eternity. Have you repented of your sin and trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If Jesus is God, if he is eternal, then we would expect that he is the creator. John makes it, takes us back to the beginning in verses 1 through 3 in order to understand who Jesus is, we have to go back to the beginning. Since Jesus has no beginning, then we have to go back to, the begin to our beginning, which is creation. And Genesis records that God created the heavens and the earth. In verse 1 of Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And John declares Jesus' connection with, with creation because he is the creator. Verse 3, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. Outside of time, eternal, God the creator. There was nothing created before he created the world. This is further proof that Jesus is God because we affirm that God is the creator. We find that Jesus is God and our creator. And the creator came into creation. No creation is re creation is reserved for God alone who created all things seen and unseen for he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation for by him all things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Colossians 1, 15 through 17. Just so there's no confusion... The cults want to say firstborn means that he was born, had a beginning. Firstborn is not here about being the first to come into existence. It has to do with inheritance. Throughout the Bible, we have many cases where the right of inheritance was given to someone other than the firstborn. The right of inheritance is not about birth order. It's about inheritance. The firstborn over all creation. He inherited creation because he created all things and in him all things consist he holds the universe together scientifically there's no explanation for the atom to stay together what holds those little electrons so tight to those uh, neutrons and protons in the middle what holds it together so that we have trees and mountains and rocks and people. There's empty space in the middle of these. And they have to do all kinds of things to get that ele little electron off. And they call that the atom bomb.
God holds the universe together. God the Son has received the birthright of creation because it belongs to him already because he is the creator. I want you to think about this as I conclude. What's the bigger creation? The creation of the universe, the stars, the world, and everything that's in it? Or a new heart that he puts in a person who follows Jesus? changes our heart. He changes our mind. We are somebody different than we were before. That's an incredible piece of creation that he does in our life. Look at what it says in Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We're new creatures in Christ. We have a new heart. We have a new purpose. We have a new destination. And yet God loved us despite our sinful state and came and died on a cross to pay for our sin. sin. Worship Jesus as our creator. Not the creation, but the creator. If you haven't put your trust in Jesus, do it today. Don't go home without trusting Jesus. Jesus is eternal. He is God. And he is the creator. Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this reminder of who Jesus is. And we could spend weeks and weeks just on this one subject because there's so much to it. But Lord, you've allowed us to get a glimpse into Jesus who is eternal, our God, who died for us. And rose again and and is at face to face with you again. And Lord, we acknowledge who Jesus is. Because we understand how important it is to our salvation. And we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to transition to our communion time. And uh, I do hope you had a chance to get one of the little cups. You can go back there if you, if you forgot and get one. But I want us to think about just a couple of things as we come to the Lord's table. God took on flesh. Like a coat. And that flesh was torn. And his blood was spilled. When we think about Jesus and the communion and what these elements represent, we are reminded of the great sacrifice. Now, God didn't have to do this. He didn't have to pay for our sin. He could have just wiped out everybody at the flood. Could just wipe out Adam and Eve and start it over. But God didn't do that because his purpose was to prove his love, to prove his grace, his mercy, and we're the objects of that. So as we come to the table, this is a solemn occasion 
a reminder of the great sacrifice of Jesus. And I want us to just take a moment to examine ourselves, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 27 and 28. Therefore, whoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Verse 29, it says, For whoever... For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. This little cup with the wafer is for believers, those that have trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior and in right standing with him. That means that our sins are confessed up. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that right now. Confess up your sins. I'm going to pray for the bread and then uh, at the same, after a few few moments, and then we will uh, partake of that, the bread together. Lord, we fail you often, and without the blood of Jesus and his body broken for us, we would be lost forever. Thank you for creating us and thank you for providing a way for us to be saved. And we acknowledge that we are sinful and that we acknowledge that, we're sin that we have sinned against you. And we also thank you for your forgiveness that you've offered and Lord, as we take this bread and we're reminded of the body of Jesus that was broken for us, four thousand years after creation, he came. Two thousand years ago, and we're waiting for his return. And we're commanded to partake of the Lord's table till you return. And we look forward to that in Jesus' name. You take the little wafer out of the top of your cup. I know it's hard sometimes to get it out. <laughs> In verse 23 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord... Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat the bread together. By that simple act of eating the bread, we are acknowledging that we are in communion, in oneness with him. We acknowledge that his death on the cross meant something to us. And the same is true of the cup, which is, represents his blood that was spilled for us on the cross. It's red so that it reminds us of the color of blood have you ever thought about God created the grape at the very beginning, knowing that someday he would use this as a symbol of his blood? And as we drink, we are reminded that we too partake and accept his blood spilt for us. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for the blood of Jesus that was built, we can't imagine what that would be like. Leaving heaven and coming down to earth with a mission, being rejected by your own people, and yet, Lord, you did it anyway, and we're grateful because you saved us also. Thank you for this cup 
as a reminder of your blood in Jesus' name. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let's drink together. O oh, come, Lord Jesus. We're looking forward to him coming, aren't we? Just a quick reminder, two things. The, the benevolence offering is the offering plate in the very back on the table. Uh, if you want to give for our deacon's fund, uh, don't forget your regular offerings go in the box. And then there's the, the, the sign up for our VBS. And there's some categories you can say, I'm interested in doing this, this, or this. You can mark all of the boxes if you want. Uh, but uh, so we can pitch you in wherever needed. So that'd be great, you know, if you were willing to do all of them. But uh, we're, you can only be in one place at a time. So with that, let me close us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you and love you, Lord. Uh, it's humbling. As we come, as we leave today, Lord, uh, we're reminded of the message of the cross goes to the world and we are leaving this building to go into the world, so to speak. Let us take with us the good news of Jesus. And even though it's controversial, Lord, it's always been and it always will be. And we, and we love you and we know that you have people prepared to hear the message. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed. Thank you.